Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you about the 100,000 Genomes Project. And I realise I'm the thing stopping you from lunch, so I will try and keep to time. I'm sure many of you are well aware of the project. So what I'm going to do is just go through a bit of the background, then talk about some of the um, process pathways involved and what's had to change to actually make this a possibility. Briefly, because I'm not sure um, whether everyone will have seen this, some of the results and their potential uses. And then some of the program legacy, which is probably where more of the quality and standardization actually comes into it. So starting with the background of the project, it was announced by our then Prime Minister, David Cameron, in 2012 that we were going to sequence 100,000 genomes. The Chief Medical Officer was um, told to set up a strategic priorities working group to decide what to sequence. And the initial recommendation was some rare diseases, certain cancers, and some infectious diseases. So all those areas where it was thought that genomic medicine could actually make a tangible difference to patient outcomes. And there were four quite lofty aims behind the program. One, obviously, was to bring benefit to NHS patients, as this was ultimately being paid for by um, the Department of Health, to create an ethical program which was based on consent, to provide data which would enable new scientific discoveries and medical insights, and perhaps provide new drug targets and new treatments, and to kickstart the development of the UK genomics industry. So not just the sequencing, but the interpretation, the annotation, and all the things that go downstream from that. So in the cancer program, there were two major aims. One was to transform the delivery of molecular testing within NHS clinical care, and that's part of the legacy of the program. And the other was to provide this great um, research uh, resource, which was molecular data um, combined with longitudinal clinical data, which would go on collecting ad infinitum. So in order to deliver this, an infrastructure was set up, which involved 13 um, genomic medicine centers, um, each of these organizations had a lead hospital as the sort of contract holder and then a number of affiliated hospitals as the local delivery partners. It was meant to be integrated along re um, existing regional genetic laboratory lines and pathology services and other clinical genetic services and maps of the academic health services networks. And in order, as this was a relatively new venture, to provide the, the knowledge and the, the skills to actually bring this about, um, Health Education England got involved in a genomics education program with masters and postgraduate uh, modules delivered by 10 universities nationwide was also developed. And education and training needs within each of the NHS GMCs was an important component. So just quickly to whip through the timeline related to cancer, a few highlights. Um, the first pilot samples were collected uh, about 18 months after the program was announced. And this includes both formal and fixed paraffin embedded and fresh open tissues. The first wave, um, the majority of the GMCs were announced towards the end of 2014. Um, the research side of it, the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnerships, partnerships which are groups of researchers who came together to interrogate the data um, when it was available, um, they were established in 2015. The first recruitment to the main program happened in 2015. Quite a delay, but the first results from the main program still started filtering back in 2016, realizing that this wasn't going to be all that clinically relevant. In 2017, Fast Track started, which actually gets results back in an absolute maximum of 20 working days and often substantially less. Um, and then earlier on this year, the 10,000 patient was recruited. They've not all been sequenced yet, um, but we're getting towards that target of the 100,000 genomes, just to say it's not a 50-50 split between cancer and rare diseases. This is obviously a haematology meeting, so looking at the haematology timeline, it's rather more sparse. CLL pilot was initiated with Professor Anna Shu around the time of the other um, cancer pilots, but for various reasons, the first main program haematology samples were only submitted in 2017, meaning that the first results only just started to come back now, and I've actually got some of those to show you. So in terms of what is eligible for sequencing within this program, um, the eligibility criteria have got wider and wider as it's proved harder and harder to recruit patients. So all leukemias and myeloma, um, patients with leukemia and myeloma are eligible. Um, if you've got a lymphoproliferative disease and you're going to be having treatment, you're eligible. And then other refers to things like triple negative MPDs and overlap syndrome. The higher risk as determined by the number of blast myelodysplastic syndrome and some special cases of chronic myeloid leukemia. Either you respond very well or very badly um, to tyrosine kinase inhibitor or you have 
um, last accelerated phase or additional cytogenetic abnormalities. In terms of numbers that have been recruited so far, this refers to the whole cancer program. There's about 15,000 samples, which represents 7,500 thousand patients um, with actual live samples going through the system. And so far, about 3,000 results have been returned to the various genomic medicine centres. When you look at what percentage of those at Mimonk, the numbers are pretty small. Um, and this is just uh, the most recent breakdown. There were a little over 100 patients who'd entered the sequencing program and about another 200 or so um, with samples sat in the GMCs ready to be sent. So therefore, some of the data I'm going to have to tell you about relates to solid tumour rather than haematology, but where possible, I will give you examples from haematology. So just looking um, at the processes that needed to be changed along the way to actually make this project a reality, um, just running through the process diagram, a patient with a malignancy or suspected malignancy is approached, and if they wish to consent, it's consented. They have clinical data and appropriate samples collected, and this program is based upon the fact that you always at least sequence a tumour and a normal tissue control um, to allow you to A, remove any rare private SNPs um, or other um, constitutional genetic change, and also look at constitutional changes which may be related to the cancer in question. Samples are sent to a biorepository where they are QC'd and plated. They then go to the sequencing centre and meet the contractual requirements of depth of sequencing. And the data is referred, um, sent back to Genomics England. It does some of the annotation and a level of interpretation. Um, this is then in an anonymous, anonymous form resides in the um, Genomics England data embassy where researchers and commercial entities can apply for access. In this case, it's paid access. Um, and meanwhile, the data is de-anonymized and sent back to the referring laboratory. Because at the moment there is no ISO accreditation for the pathway end-to-end, -end, anything which is found which might be clinically actionable needs to undergo orthogonal testing. And this, anything which is um, demonstrated is then reported back to the clinician in the normal fashion. So when you relate this to a patient, the patient needs to have a sample with greater than 40% neoplastic cells, need to have some sort of constitutional um, sample to use um, as your normal control. You have your tumour variants, you take away your constitutional variants, you end up with your somatic variants. Some of these might be obviously actionable and you would hope you've already been tested for with standard of care. Some of these might be more on the edge and may allow clinical trial entry. Probably the vast majority of them, no one is going to know what to do with. At the same time, some clinically relevant germline variants will be looked at and all of this data is put into the research embassy. So one of the things that I've had to change, what are the problems? Well, the first thing, this relates to lymphoma, but predominantly to solid tumours, is that standard um, histological specimen processing involves putting it in formalin. Um, that's what all our antibodies uh, for immunohistochemistry are validated on. You then embed it in wax, and if you want to get the DNA out of it, you've got to um, somehow get rid of the wax, depersonize it, um, and extract the DNA, and the processes of extracting the DNA and the formalin itself both alters the nucleotides and shears the DNA, so already you've not got a very good substrate to start with. And this is just some of the early data from that pilot. You remember I said that you could put fresh frozen and formalin fixed paraffin embedded. It's the top stream on each of these you want to look at. This is showing the structural variants, so the transmutations in these genomes, which are all from adjacent um, samples from the same um, tumour. In fresh frozen, there's probably rather more translocations that you would normally expect, but it's nothing like here in your non-optimized your non FFPE, where it looks like someone's just done a spirograph diagram. Here, um, where you optimize it, which means you leave it in formula for the absolute minimum amount of time you can get away with to have reasonable fixation to have your antibodies work, you've still got a lot of additional structural variants compared to here. So even in here, any one of those structural variants, how are you going to know if you haven't got your fresh tissue control that um, that's not an artifact? Therefore, it's necessary to um, find some alternative to FFPE. The gold standard has always been fresh um, snap freezing at the bedside or in, in theatre in liquid nitrogen. That's not very practical in a lot of places. So other things have been explored, such as just refrigerating the samples immediately until they can go back to the path lab and then be apportioned for your standard diagnostics and for freezing, making sure you've got some way of making sure that what you're looking down the microscope at is somehow um, equivalent to what you've said for sequencing. 
Alternatively, you can vacuum pack and you may not need the um, refrigeration in the short term. And then evaluating either um, other genome friendly alternative fixatives and packaging as well. Then you've got the issue of well, what you should you be sequencing. This program was set up looking at surgical resections, but it provides plenty of DNA for sequencing. But many of these patients are cured, and what are you actually going to do with their genome? And if the tumor did recur, do you want to sequence the tumor they had at the beginning or the tumor they've got now? Would you want to take another sample? So, therefore, the program has started to move on to looking at biopsies. Um, there's a bit of an issue though, the program was based on prospective consent. Um, the number of patients having a biopsy, which doesn't turn out to be cancer, is very high, so you may end up consenting for patients for every one who actually has cancer. And a lot of these patients may have undue anxiety by going through a large cancer program consent when actually they just have a reactive condition. Therefore, um, all of these bodies got together and endorsed a consensus statement which said it was reasonable within the NHS to treat um, a biopsy if you were taking multiple biopsies in a different way um, that would be suitable for uh, genomic analysis. Um, and therefore, um, when it's uh, possible to take extra biopsies um, in places that are enacting the program, one is often being stored, frozen um, back in the lab and then the patient is consented and DNA extracted once it's no more biopsy good. And this is, there was a great worry that actually we'd never get enough DNA and we'd never get successful um, sequencing out of these biopsies. And this is just demonstrating that at the level of what gets submitted to um, the biobank and then to Illumina for sequencing, and I take it that those with very low DNA um, yields will have been weeded out at the GMC level, we have quite um, high success rates for sequencing. Then there's the question of, and this is more relevant to haematology, what are you using for your constitutional control? It's very straightforward. For solid tumours, you can just take DNA from your white blood cells. However, given that white blood cells are usually um, the tumour cell in your haematological disorder, that's clearly not going to work as your normal constitutional control, particularly in the myeloid disorders. So saliva is a possible alternative in um, particularly the lymphoid malignancies. Um, providing you haven't got a very high number of circulating lymphoid um, cells in the uh, peripheral blood. Um, but this is just to demonstrate the problem with taking and sequencing a saliva sample in a patient with a myeloid disorder. So these are a number of different mutations. This is a peripheral blood sample from a patient who had a blast count of almost 200, and you can see the difference the AX. He then had some hydroxycarbamide and his um, white blood cell count came right down. There was actually even the emergence of a differential, so the blasts were considerably less than the three. Um, and the red dots represent the VAF of the same mutations within the saliva, um, which must be myeloid cell contamination. And what's particularly worrying is you appear to have some new mutations emerging in the saliva. So you've managed to show clonal selection or clonal evolution in the saliva, meaning this is not going to be a particularly useful germline control. Um, other options for um, the myeloid disorders include skin biopsies, which a number of researchers have used in a pilot is underway to make sure that there isn't um, any contamination with the myeloid cells. The gold standard is to take a skin biopsy and to culture the fibroblasts. Again, this involves a patient having a skin biopsy and it also involves the infrastructure for processing. So the latest pilot, which is about to get underway, is looking at column-enriched T cells. There is a possibility that you may have early mutations in the hematopoietic stem cell, which are in the T cells as well as the myeloid cells, but this is something that's being looked into at the moment. And then as I alluded to on the timeline, the other thing which has really sort of turned or allowed the program to become more clinically relevant is the concept of fast track, which is samples being returned on now an average um, under uh, three weeks. Um, once the sample is submitted to sequencing, actually getting data back into the GMC. So it's moving into a more um, relevant time scale. So now moving on to what sort of results are being returned and their potential uses. So this is what you get back, a whole genome analysis. And this particular one is one of the key histological um, reports so far, and it's a case of myeloma. Um, so first of all, you just get your surface plot, which demonstrates overall genomic complexity. And in fact, for myeloma, this is probably the most relevant thing, because I happen to know that the fish results of this show the gain of 1Q, which you can see there, and an 11-14 translocation. 
So there's clearly a lot of other stuff that's been picked up by the whole genome sequencing, but the two clinically relevant findings that were fished for prior to the sample being submitted as standard of care have been detected. You then get a list of all your variants, um, and the way these reports work is that um, domain one are variants for which there is believed to be um, some clinical actionability. This uses the website or the back end of the website of genome oncology to assign clinical trials that may be um, relevant to that mutation and tumor group. You see, in this case, there actually is a myeloma trial, but it's done on the level of lymphoid malignancy, myeloid malignancy, solid tumor malignancy. You can click through and it will actually give you information about the trial um, relevance to that variant. You then have domains two and three. Domain two are all your small variants which are in cancer census genes, which is a list of genes thought to be involved in cancer maintained by the Sanger Center. Domain three is everything else. You get a list of your structural variants, and this is just showing you a list of all those one key gains. You then get some higher level analysis. Um, and I have some data relating to colorectal cancer to show you in a minute relating to this, but it shows you the context of the mutation. So are you getting a particular nucleotide change in a particular nucleotide context? And this allows you to assign mutational signatures, and the relevant one here, the one in yellow, is associated with um, activation-induced deanimation, which you do see in the hypermutation, which you might expect, expect in a B-cell malignancy, which is essentially what myeloma is. And then you get plots showing areas of hypermutation. So when you get a lot of these raindrops um, falling down, you have increased numbers of mutations in a small area. And so just to go through a sort of single case with only about 10 or 20 results returned, it's quite hard to find one which shows some clinical utility. Um, but this was a, a lady who were, had a long-standing apparent diagnosis of JAK2 positive essential thrombocytemia which had gotten to the stage of transforming to myelofibrosis and was re um, referred for a trial. Because she had emerging blast, the question of could she have transformed to AML was um, considered, and she had several attempts at an aspirate to get material for cytogenetics, but not surprisingly, because of the fibrosis, it was never possible to get a successful aspirate. She therefore underwent some whole genome sequencing on the peripheral blood, and the potentially interesting finding is she has a... Ooh, and the answer, she has a deletion of 5Q. Um, in terms of a mutation, we already knew about the um, JAK2 B617F mutation. She also had two TP53 mutations and a U2AF1. So the summary of the key findings, we knew about the JAK2, we found some TP53 mutations, and she also has this deletion of 5Q. So there's two possible scenarios. It's exactly as I told you. She had ET, she got my, um, transformed to myelofibrosis and then transformed to acute myeloid leukemia. But what if actually the diagnosis was slightly different further on and the, actually she had a del 5 q jak 2 b 617 f mutated proliferative condition, which is described. And actually when you look at the bits of aspirate that were reported, she had quite dysplastic, hyperlobated megakaryocytes. So it is possible that actually the diagnosis was an overlap syndrome rather than anything else. Why does this matter? Well, there's evidence that these patients can have a clinical response to lenalidomide, and this is just an example of such a patient. Here's the platelet count coming down, the hemoglobin going up, the JAK2 and the 5Q- minus going away with the instigation of lenalidomide. It was all too late for this patient, but it just gives a bit of an example of how potentially this sort of um, data and additional information may be a clinical utility. Because they sequenced far more... Um, cases. There's much more interesting data at the moment in the solid tumour sphere, and this is particularly focusing on the signatures. You've got your usual range of various mutations, and all of these are linked to a clinical trial by my cancer genome. But if you look here, um, these are the uh, signatures, and they correlate very nicely with your mutational burden. Here are your ultra-mutators, which is associated with Col-E, and here are your hyper-mutators, which are associated with microsatellite instability and DNA mismatch repair. And if you look at it in a slightly different way, once you've removed all those with your KRAS, NRAS, and BRAS mutations, which you might consider conventionally actionable, you've got a little group of um, samples with these signatures and high mutation burdens. And these may be relevant to immunotherapy such as pembrolizumab, which has recently had a license granted by the FDA for any um, tumour with uh, mismatch repair signature. And this is a sim similar sort of thing. This is just looking at mutations in lung cancer samples that have been submitted to the program. 
many of you may be aware of the lung matrix trial, which is a series of phase two um, trials for patients who sort of exhausted standard of care treatment in non-small cell lung cancer um, using targeted therapy against the detection of fugitive biomarkers. And you can see that there's a number of patients who these are probably sequencing from resection, so at the moment are okay, but if their disease was to um, relapse, which is quite common in lung cancer, may be relevant to this trial, and this is just the same data plotted geographically. So moving on to the legacy of the program. So I hope that I've demonstrated that pathways have been developed which have allowed detection of appropriate tissue for whole genome sequencing, processes have been put in place so you can go prospectively and retrospectively consent patients for whole genome sequencing, and the National Sequencing Centre is now able to process samples in a timely manner that you get results back of potential clinical utility in a clinically relevant time frame. But as you probably all know, the programme is about to finish and sample collection is supposed to finish by the end of September with sequencing by the end of December. So now we have the question of, well, how do we ensure that the data coming back and those results still to be returned is going to be consistently interpreted? How do we remove the need for that in-house accreditation? Because let's face it, at the moment we're using whole genome sequencing as quite an expensive screening test. And how do we prevent that all the efforts that have gone into this programme not being lost and ensure that this sort of genetic testing becomes available for all? So in terms of the consistent interpretation of results, I think it is recognised that the relevance or actionability of any particular aberration is very patient-specific. It doesn't just depend on what the tumour is, but it's the individual clinical context. If a patient has had a curative resection, it's probably not going to be of any use to them. If there's someone who's got metastatic disease and has exhausted all standard care, potentially it's going to be a lot more um, useful. And it's important to know what is actually potentially actionable for that individual patient, not just generally as a whole, as to what you're going to validate at the moment using an orthogonal method, otherwise you're spending out a lot of money for no return. Also, by definition, an awful lot of what we're finding in whole genome sequencing is of unknown significance. So there are two initiatives to try and ensure a pragmatic, consistent approach across the different genomic medicine centres. The first is a guidance document for validating and reporting, um, which some of you may have been involved with in different ways, and there will be an equivalent hematology one um, worked on in the forthcoming months. And this is um, to try and ensure that everyone is interpreting variants in the same fashion and reporting things back in a similar fashion. And then there's the development of the molecular tumour board, and this is a slide that I stole from um, Louisa in South London. This is the idea, it's sort of the equivalent to an MDT, but not called an MDT because of every, all the connotations that the MDT has, but it's the laboratory um, forum for discussing the results, preferably with relevant clinicians, so you can work out what is relevant, what needs to be validated, um, and these should be occurring in a similar fashion in all DMCs. Moving on to the accreditation of the whole genome sequencing pro um, pathway, as I said, it is not currently ISO accredited from end to end, which means that we have to do a lot more testing of anything we want to act on. That's quite a problem when you're looking at something like a mutational signature or mutational burden, unless you can find the underlying um, mutation that causes that. These are not easy things to validate unless you're running very, very large panels. Illumina are accrediting all the parts their parts of the pipeline, Genomics England are taking steps to accredit their activities, and I think that will be a stepwise um, process, and it includes validation work on variant detection. This is just an example of the, the hematological malignancies of the proposed approach to actually um, validating the variant detection. For those samples where we have detected variants within Genomics England, we're going back and seeing what standard of care testing confirmed that. We're soliciting cohorts of um, samples to be submitted in an anonymous fashion in order that a broad range of different types of genetic aberration um, can be confirmed. And the other way round, for those samples where we found a lot of variants and there is no standard of care testing, we're investigating the possibility of finding a UCAS accredited either array or panel test depending on the type of variant to um, validate in the other direction. And then finally, there's not much point having these great um, services validated and potentially available if we don't have equity of access across the country. And following on from the Genomic Medicine Service and alluded to in the um, previous talk is the sort of grand reorganisation of um, genetic services. 
And what this is underpinned by in cancer is the testing directory, which I think is a very loathed document, which basically lays out what testing should be taking place in the country. Just to very quickly talk about how that came into being, NHS England set up a group called the Cancer Transition Working Group, which was scientific and clinical expertise, who undertook two exercises where they looked at possible targets and technologies and then a more focused approach about essential and extended targets across a range of tumours and whether these would be best suited by either a next generation sequencing panel or whole genome sequencing approach. Out of this came a sort of strategy for where testing would like to be in the future, as well as an actual list of potential tests. This was shared with potential bidders in the re-procurement exercise before Christmas. Vast quantities of feedback was received. As a result of this, a number of omissions were just automatically put in. Um, some extra evidence was requested to justify inclusion. And the guidelines for inclusion was a target which could actually alter um, management of a patient within the UK. Um, all of that evidence was reviewed and a final version was produced and this is now going to be reviewed in the first instance in six months and then annually to try and keep up with the pace of change. This is just an example of what the directory looks at. It's organised by technology target scope and the indication. Um, the idea is that these will be arranged into the smallest number of panels um, possible. A few um, cancers are going to have whole genome sequencing to start with, but that's quite small numbers. And this is just to outline um, the testing strategy. This is probably where we are at the moment. This is where the genomic medicine service will start. And the idea is that panels will get bigger and more will move to whole genome sequencing as and when the data is available. So just in summary, the 100,000 Genomes Project is coming to an end at the end of this year, and it will have sequenced tumours from thousands of patients. It has enabled the development of infrastructure, pathways and practices to allow whole genome sequencing to take place within the NHS. It is able to return results in a relatively timely fashion now, um, and there are guidelines and processes in development to aid with the consistent interpretation. So to answer the question, 100,000 Genomes Project molecular diagnosis coming of age, I'm not sure it's quite come of age, but I think it's definitely on route. Thank you very much.